Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker tonight, Derek Jewell. Derek uh, is well known to almost everyone in this room, I'm sure. Trained at the University of Oxford, uh, specialized in GI under the famous Sidney Truelove at Oxford, and then went on to Stanford, which I didn't know about him until I was reading this, um, and then the Royal Free Hospital in London, uh, and after Dr. Truelove's retirement, returned to Oxford. He's currently an emeritus professor of gastroenterology at the University of Oxford and has served um, in, as the president of the British Society of Gastro, a member of the research committee of the Royal College of Physicians, and he received the mentorship award from the AGA in 2007. Um, Dr. Jewell also was a friend of Dr. Kersner's and a number of DDWs ago when it was in Chicago, went to visit him at his apartment, uh, and I know that Dr. Kersner valued that tremendously. So please join me in welcoming Professor uh, Derek Jewell to the podium. Well, thank you very much uh, indeed, and it's a, a very great honor to have been asked to take part in this symposium. I'm very grateful to, to David for the invitation. Um, uh, I've known Joe for, for very many years, and as you just heard, it was just three years ago, I spent a, a delightful hour with him uh, in his apartment when he was sat in front of his computer his failing eyesight meant that he had to look at it through a big magnifying glass, but he was still reviewing um, and learning. It was very impressive. Now, I've got to reflect on the, uh, the IBD as it's developed over the years um, with a special uh, emphasis on management. Well, you all know how to manage the disease, so I was wondering about what I could tell you. So this is a slight ramble. It's a, it'll be a bit of a history lesson um, and, and hopefully a few anecdotes that you may not be aware of. Now, there was a, 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 an amazing meeting in Bologna uh, in 1988. That was celebrating 900 years of the medical school in Bologna. Um, but there were two almost 90-year-olds um, um, sat there in the front row, as you can see with uh, uh, Joe there with Sidney Truelove. And it was a great privilege because I had to take them for lunch, and we had to walk quite a long way for lunch. Um, and neither of them were particularly um, agile at that stage. And I had one on each arm. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I know photographs were taken, and I have um, sent many emails to people who were at the meeting. And, and you see David Sacker and Herbert Locks just sat there a bit further back. Um, but, but I can't find the, the photographs, so you have to, to, to make do with this one. The milestones, I think, for UC are just interesting just to go through because it was 1859, as I will show you, that UC was first recognized as a disease distinct from bacterial dysentery. In the 1920s, uh, it was well characterized clinically. In the 1930s, uh, bacteria were thought to be the, the uh, major etiological factor, and sulfonamides were, were given, and we'll come back to that. Um, 40s and 50s, we go into the first effective therapy for the disease, um, sulfasalazine and corticosteroids, followed by the thiopurines. The surgeons um, were, were not far behind, and the introduction of the pouch in the 1970s um, has transformed surgery for ulcerative colitis. Um, the 1980s saw refinement in managing uh, severe attacks. Um, and then, of course, we go into the era of biologics and small molecules, um, which uh, uh, I will leave Steph to talk to. For Crohn's disease, I think the big milestone was obviously 1932, um, with the description of the disease. And I'm not uh, um, implying any thoughts about um, Scotland becoming an independent country, because of course it was a Scotsman um, DL in uh, about 1913 that recognized that 
all ileal strictures were not tuberculosis. But he really didn't carry that on f forward, and, and, and so that's why I put 1932 as a major landmark. The surgeons were um, soon learned that you couldn't chop the disease out, and, and by the 1970s, a concept of minimal surgery, managing strictures with stricture plasties, limited resections, really began to change the whole surgical um, nature of managing the disease. Therapy was difficult because Crohn's disease was such a difficult disease to manage that people didn't know how to create what we now would call endpoints for clinical trials. So treatment was just as if uh, the patients had ulcerative colitis. So it was sulfasalazine, it was steroids, and subsequently azathioprine and the thiopurines. And, and the real um, milestone, I think, became was in 1976 when the CDAI was published in gastroenterology because that meant that you could actually measure something about the disease objectively. Um, and, and then we go into the period of evidence-based trials um, uh, which you all know about. So let's go back to the beginning. Um, 19th century London was a was a cesspit of um, bloody diarrhea. Um, and Samuel Wilkes, a physician at Guy's Hospital, recognized that there was a much more chronic disorder, um, uh, which was not bacterial dysentery. Um, he published a case on the morbid appearances of the colon of the unfortunate Miss Banks. Um, and Miss Banks had a, a very nasty colitis and it was widely thought that her general practitioner had been um, poisoning her with mercury. Um, he was arrested, charged, and um, uh, brought up in court in, in, in the Royal Courts of Justice. Um, was actually let off, but two or three years later, um, he was again arrested for giving people mercury poisoning, and he was actually hanged in the end. Um, that's by the way. Um, by a, the early 20th century, the London physicians had managed to gather about 300 cases of ulcerative colitis, this new disease, and there was a very heated debate published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Medicine. Um, and the debate was whether it was bacterial, which most people thought, but tin foods were coming in and preservatives were being added to foods. and, and so there was a, a strong um, lobby for, for that being the cause of this disease. And of course, there was a psychosomatic um, uh, lobby as well. And you could wonder whether we have actually made any progress since 1909. But um, <laughs> Now, this is Sir Arthur Hurst. Uh, he was a physician at Guy's Hospital. Um, he founded the British Society of Gastroenterology. But he was really responsible for the first clinical description of ulcerative colitis. And he described it as a gradual onset. He recognized that limited distal disease could present with constipation. Um, he'd spent many years uh, in Egypt. He knew about um, uh, bacillary dys dysentery and amoebic dysentery, and he knew that ulcerative colitis was quite different from amoebiasis but was very similar endoscopically to uh, bacillary dysentery. Of course, he had no treatment, um, and treatment was these things here. Um, he liked his colonic irrigation um, with a silver salt and until the authorities decided that was dangerous, so he changed to tannic acid, which patients didn't like because it was painful. Um, you see soured milk on the list there, um, a probiotic, maybe, um, an anti-dysenteric serum. Now, editors of scientific journals were not very vigorous in the 1920s, and so um, the report of this experiment is, is not actually very well documented. But he took anti-serum from patients recovering from um, dysentery, and he infused it 
that into his colitic patients um, in increasing volumes on consecutive days. He soon learned that anaphylaxis could be a problem, so there was adrenaline ha handy. Um, but he re really, he, using this technique, um, he really had some dramatic effects, um, which he published in 1935. And interestingly, for, from today's perspective, that he found that if he went on treating these patients um, until the sigmoidoscopic appearances went uh, back to normal, then they did not relapse nearly as quickly uh, as if they um, had residual endoscopic um, inflammation. Now, Hurst and uh, Dr. Crone um, were in quite um, frequent correspondence with one another. Uh, and um, and this, there's a little um, letter, really, by Crone and, and Dr. Rosenach, and I don't know who he was, who'd also tried anti-dysenteric serum, um, said it was wonderful. There is Dr. Crone, um, and you, you all know him of him. Now, the two effective treatments, sulfonamides and corticosteroids, and I thought I'd say a little bit about the sulfonamides. It was a, they were discovered in Germany in 1932 by Domag, um, and it was rapidly shown to be effective against a number of bacterial um, infections, but particularly dip, Diplostreptococcus. Um, it's an interesting bit of history that Domac was awarded no the Nobel Prize for um, create, uh, discovering the sulfonamides, uh, but Hitler refused to allow him to accept it. It was trialed in uh, rheumatoid arthritis with very little benefit. Um, but the Diplostreptococcus story got over to uh, Dr. Bargan, the Mayo Clinic, who Tried, tried it, and it didn't really work very well. In the meantime, um, the professor of microbiology here, Gail Dack, together with doctors Palmer and Kersner, had been describing bacterium necroforum in the stool of colitic patients. Um, and so they did some trials of both sulfaguanidine and sulfanilamide. Uh, now, it didn't have very much effect, but what was so beautiful about those trials, when you go back and look at the papers, um, was that uh, the, the clinical uh, progress was followed by uh, assays of the sulfonamide, both in serum and in feces, and, and, and by microbiological culture. So it was a really beautifully designed um, clinical studies with, with, with a scientific rigor behind them. So. The story of the sulfonamides then um, comes to Nana Svartz, who was a rheumatologist in Sweden. Um, she knew about aspirin, of course, that had been known uh, as an anti-inflammatory for rheumatoid arthritis for many years. Um, but she had the idea that if you link the sulfonamide to, to aspirin then, uh, and, and gave that to patients, uh, with rheumatoid arthritis, then the whole thing would get better because she thought rheumatoid was an infective disorder. So finally, the, pharma the, the pharmacists in uh, Pharmacia um, created sulfasalazine. Um, and the other person here is my, my mentor, Sidney Trulove, and we'll come back to his contribution in a second. Um, I should have said that Nana Svartz published a paper um, in about 1947 uh, on the treating about 160 patients with rheumatoid arthritis with this new uh, drug, sulfasalazine. Um, nobody's joints got better, but there were some patients um, uh, in that study who also had ulcerative colitis, and she noted that the colitis got better. And we had lots of uncontrolled studies of sulfasalazine, um, but then we had some placebo-controlled trials in active colitis um, from uh, the central middle sex, Hugh Barron uh, 
uh, George Mashevitz, Avery Jones, um, and, and a group in Cambridge. Uh, the maintenance effects of sulfasalazine, again, um, beautifully shown in a controlled trial, again from the Central Middlesex Hospital, George Mashevitz and John Leonard Jones um, and um, uh, Avery Jones. And then 1973 comes along and uh, uh, Sidney Chulove shows that that maintenance effect is preserved uh, over time. Uh, and uh, he then did a maintenance study uh, of uh, one gram, two grams, and four grams, and showed that for sulfasalazine, two grams was the optimal dose. Now, here's Sydney in his office, and he was a great thinker. And he was thinking, and I sat in a chair on the other side of the desk behind the door, um, debating about whether it was a um, sulfasalazine the 5 salicylic acid or the sulfapyridine that was the active ingredient. And um, he, uh, oh, by the way, the, you see all those red box files on the top of the shelf. That contains all the patient data, the 624 patients that uh, form the basis of those papers on the course and prognosis of ulcerative colitis. So Sydney came up with this idea of testing these three compounds in enema form. And uh, he had a young Bangladeshi research fellow just arrived, that's Azad Khan on the right. Um, on the left, with the moustache, is a very young Massimo Campieri. Um, and in the middle is uh, Bupi Anand, uh, who um, is now in, uh, in Baylor in, uh, as a hepatologist. But Azad Khan was put to work to uh, do this enema study. And um, you, you will all know this, uh, the results of this study. And it clearly showed uh, that uh, it was the 5-ASA that was producing just as good uh, results as the sulfasalazine enema. Um, but there was very little effect with sulfapyridine. So that. Uh, uh, I don't actually, I think, have a pointer here. Yes, I do, sorry. Um, so there's sulfasalazine splitting into sulfapyridine and um, uh, mesalazine, as we now call it. And there was a great flurry in the pharmaceutical industry, as you all know, with different mesalazine formulations um, uh, and pro-molecules like balsalazide and ulsalazine. Well, I'm not going to dwell on that because you all know about it. Let's just step back and go to corticosteroids. First introduced in 1946 um, in, in medicine, again predominantly for uh, rheumatological conditions. But it was again the Oxford study by, by Sidney Chulove of intravenous cortisone uh, for severe colitis in 1954 that I think was a real landmark um, a very nicely performed study. Uh, it meant that people with severe colitis had a dramatic reduction in their time in hospital. And as you can see, there was a dramatic uh, fall in, in um, mortality. Um, the 60s were um, shown to be uh, uh, the many trials showing oral prednisolone over placebo and the development of topical therapy. And I, I remember asking Sidney how he got the idea of topical therapy. And it was because the dermatologists were using steroids for the skin. And he thought, well, if you can have topical uh, therapy on the skin, why can't you have topical therapy on the rectal mucosa? And that's how the whole thing started. Um, and, and then, of course, with the 1980s, we get steroids with high first-pass metabolism. Um, again, reducing side effects very considerably. So prior to 1950, where there was no effective treatment, I had one patient I looked after in the early 80s who'd been treated by Arthur Hurst. He developed ulcerative colitis at the age of 15, and he sat in a guy's hospital bed for 18 months, having nothing but soured milk and 
um, various diets and so on. So it's easy, I think, to forget when we see the difficult patients in our tertiary referral clinics, how much progress we've made in the 50 years from 1950 up to about 2000 when the biologics uh, became um, so much more prevalent. Um, mesalazine had far fewer effects of sulfasalazine. We could use it in higher doses, and that's been highly effective in ulcerative colitis and has reduced corticosteroid usage. <coughs> so purines, again, reduce steroid usage, and one of the first trials of um, uh, azathioprine in Crohn's disease was done right here um, uh, with Dr. Kersner uh, and Dr. Rosenberg. And uh, mortality has improved uh, and improved surgical techniques. Um, uh, minimal, minimally invasive surgery has actually been a, a great boon for many of our patients. You've heard about the NFIC, the CCFA, um, its origins, and, and Joe's participation in that. Um, and the advent of these patient organizations around the world in most countries now has meant our patients are well informed. The Danish studies uh, and other studies uh, on this side of the Atlantic have shown that for the majority of our patients, they're well for most of the time, and life expectancy is now normal for UC and fairly near normal for Crohn's disease. The problem is the refractory disease in about 15% of our patients, um, which causes all the problem, um, and Steph will tell you how to manage that. Just finally, I would like to say I've been personally very grateful to, to Joe Kersner for two things. One, for some animal models of colitis that he developed, and secondly, uh, for recognizing that the disease could uh, affect many members in a single family. He published a paper with Dr. Goldgraber about colitis in animals based on something called the Arthur's reaction and the Auer reaction. The Auer model of inflammation postulated that circulate immune complexes would deposit in sites of previous inflammation. And uh, um, doctors Goldgraber and Kersner developed a, a colitis in rabbits that have been immunized with um, uh, egg albumin. We, had, we changed the, the model a little bit, um, and uh, we uh, took unimmunized rabbits, and uh, we gave them a little bit of uh, uh, one mil of a, a formalin enema, which just produces a bit of hyperemia in, in the rectum. And then about two hours later, we gave them an intravenous injection of immune complexes. And that was um, uh, human serum albumin um, added to uh, a rabbit antiserum of uh, um, human albumin. Uh, I won't go into the details, but we developed, uh, uh, that these rabbits developed a very acute colitis um, over the uh, next two weeks. And we published that with Humphrey Hodgson. I thought, we, you know, we, we've always had this notion that patients with colitis can be very well, and then they suddenly get an intercurrent infection, sore throat or a cold, and they relapse. And I thought, well, maybe, um, these rabbits, if we were, if they were pre-immunized to bacterial antigen, and then we gave them immune complexes, maybe they would go on and develop a, a chronic colitis. Um, so the next experiment was tested that, and, and sure enough, even 12 months after the um, the initial experiment, they showed um, uh, epithelial flattening, um, atrophy of the glands, and evidence of some chronic inflammation. Um, we perhaps ought to go back and revisit that model um, because um, we didn't take it any further and nobody else has. Um, so uh, that idea for the animal model came directly from studies done here. And then, of course, um, 
in the uh, late 1970s, he described in IBD um, in uh, uh, multiply affected families. And when uh, Gunnar Jenerot, Kurt Tisk, um, showed the, did the twin study in Sweden, it really kicked off um, uh, the, the genetic studies that we're now so familiar with. Uh, I remember sitting in David Wetherill's office uh, about 1990 uh, and said, look, how do we study the genetics of uh, IBD when we don't know what we're looking for? And he said, I don't know. And it was just shortly after that conversation that um, the microsatellite markers were um, described uh, by Mark Blathrop and others. Um, and that, of course, gave us the idea of um, being, looking at um, uh, families with um, siblings, two, one or more, two, more, two or more siblings affected with the disease and looking at linkage by descent using these micro, microsatellite markers. But it started here and um, uh, one is very grateful for that. Now we've talked about Joe Kersner. Um, David mentioned um, him as a clinician. Um, but he was a great inspirer, a great teacher, um, and the center of excellence that he developed here and, and the way it's prospered and going on to prosper um, is, is a true testament to uh, um, his lifetime's work. And uh, so with that, I would like to, um, to finish, uh, but just to uh, congratulate David on just in the last 24 hours, I think, um, hearing that he's been actually made chief of gastroenterology here. So uh, um, the excellence will continue. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was terrific. You know, we're happy to entertain some questions or people who have other reflections for a minute or two before we go on. I, I don't want this to feel so stiff and formal if you have other thoughts that you guys would like to share, or we can do that at the end after uh, Steph's talk. Sure. Uh, no, I just said I've known Dr. Kersner since 1978, and uh, I think I told you, you go to his clinic on Saturday morning, he had this IBD clinic, everybody would fly in, and he did this medical school. Well, here's my colleague, Dr. So-and-so, and I felt very embarrassed that these people had flown in from all over the world and saved me first, but he was a great teacher and a great mentor. He was very, very important to me in uh, my career. And he was the reason I went into gastroenterology. Yeah, uh, I was just going to for this gentleman. Not only did he work at Dr. Valentin, of course, you may not know, he, he had some expertise in, in irritable bowel syndrome. And um, he had his little bottles of... Uh, Maybe the other day, or I took your opium and that was not a drop. And I, I said, that cur you know, that cursor, you know, you can just get some Donald you know, and, and, oh, no, 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 but it's a show, you know, you can put it in the drops. And, um, you know, he, he was very beloved. Uh, and one of the little anecdotes, uh, you know, he took care of people from all over the world, and he was very well known. So one day, uh, I did take care of a world team in the Middle East, and uh, a big rug appeared in Chicago. And it was just addressed to JBK University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a fellow, I took care of one of the generals from Morocco with him. And after the general went home, and there's a whole story behind that, but when um, the general went home, a rug appeared in my apartment um, lobby. And one day I got home, and it was from the ambassador. And it was this bright pink Moroccan rug. And so at the time, we had one child. The other one hadn't arrived yet. And my wife said, well, you know, if we have a girl, maybe we'll use this. Um, but even if we have a girl, I don't think we're going to use this. <laughs> it was this ugly, ugly rug. So anyway, we, we stored at my parents in their basement. And um, ver relatively recently, a few years ago, when we purchased the house we're living in now, my mom says, all right, now it's time for you to clean out our basement. Come get that ugly rug. <laughs> so we came and got the rug, and we donated it to a place that uh, does. And it was in pristine shape because we never used it. And then Dr. Kersner, when he was uh, towards the end of his life, um, said to my wife, who was working as his assistant, I really wanted to get you and David a housewarming gift. Uh, you've both been so nice to me. Um, and I have something for you. 
and behind his couch in his living room, rolled up, was an exact replica of that same <laughs> rug, which he got also from the general <laughs> and the ambassador. And she's like, oh my God, God. <laughs> only, only he had used it. So this one wasn't even as nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many people here had gotten notes from Dr. Kersner over the years? Yeah, I mean, that was what he was known for. Any other comments, Ira? I think one of the amazing things, I didn't know that he started his career interested in infectious disease, but when you think about it, I mean, for all of us who knew us, he was practicing medicine before penicillin. I mean, that is even more interesting when, he, when I now learn that he started his career with interest in infectious disease. Nowadays, you know, penicillin is so far in the distance, but imagine practicing medicine before antibiotics. 